Welcome in to another Harmonious at Lunch. Got an interesting topic today that we've been talking about here and there over the past couple of weeks. So really cool to see a guest's perspective and an expert's perspective on this. A little bit more on that in just a second. Let's bring it to speed here at What If. Again, just a reminder, we are having a five-day workshop next week. It's coming up so quick and spots are filling up. But we're really excited about it. It's whatif.com slash navigate. We're going to build the foundation of your business. Make sure you are rock solid to grow and scale in 2024. We have seen from working with a number of clients all the way from small businesses up through Nike, there is one thing that businesses consistently get wrong and that's their foundation and integrating it through the other 10 disciplines of the business that we talk about in our harmonious architecture. So if you want to register for that, it is absolutely free. It's a five-day workshop, whatif.com slash navigate. We would love to see you there. Now, enough about me. Let's get into our guest this week. I want to first off welcome David to the show. David, welcome. So good to have you here. I am super excited to be here. Um, I'm normally on the other side of the microphone for podcasts, so I love being a guest uh, every once in a while as well. Yeah, this is cool. you got a lot going on. You're a podcast host. You're a business owner. And, and today's topic in particular, I'm very excited about and we're going to talk a little bit about maximizing your biggest asset, and that is your business. Let's talk about exiting your business. So let's let's start at the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. I think when should you think about exiting your business? Way before you want to exit. So typically, what happens is business owners are very busy, right? So let's say Brandon owns I don't know a grass cutting business. So Gr Brandon gets into the business because he likes cutting grass. And then Brandon grows a little bit and then Brandon has to do things he doesn't know how to do, like hire people, like, I don't know, file tax returns, bill customers, do marketing, all those kind of things that in, that's involved in, in a business. Then pretty soon, Brandon's grass cutting business, Brandon doesn't do anything resembling grass cutting. He's just dealing with business ownership kind of stuff. And some of those things that he needs to deal with are setting up a retirement plan, uh, financial planning, and those kind of things. But as a business owner, you're really, really busy. And it's not like you just check a box, you know, sign me up for the 401k, like if you work for a big, for a big, um, <clears throat> for a big company. So business owners are busy and they don't think about the things that they need to do with their financial planning. And they certainly don't think about what they can do because most of the time, selling the business is part of the long-term financial goal at least. So, Hey, I'm going to sell my business. I'm going to get $50 million and then I'm going to, you know, ride off into the sunset. Well, number one, where'd you get that $50 million number? Number two, are there any ways that we could maximize that? So maybe you can get more than 50 million or if 50 million is not really reasonable, we can get you something that is as reasonable as possible. And then number three, when you're working on something that you can control, like the value of your business, it takes away stress from the other things in life that you can't control. So if you own Apple stock, you have zero control over if Apple stock goes up or down. Now in your business, you have a heck of a lot of control over if, uh, if the value of your business increases or decreases. Yeah, that's such an important point too, because I think as, as business owners, starting from the beginning, a lot of people get into it, like you said, because they like to cut grass. They mm -hmm. they love the product or the process of what they sell, and they don't necessarily think about exiting or increasing their business's value. And you know, that's where we come into with the with the business architecture, scaling efficiently. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't understand that the, it takes a lot of effort to scale a company. So when when people do start to think about exiting, is that typically when they come to you or is it maybe years in advance and they want to get set up? Yeah, I mean, ideally it would be years in advance, but um, it's kind of like, you know, when was the best time to plant a tree? It was 20 years ago. When's the second best time, you know, today? So ideally it would be well in advance because there are a lot of in addition to how to sell the business, there's some also some mindset issues like what are you going to do when you retire? You know, should you sell the business? You know, you might think about, well, I have this business that's worth X millions of dollars, but maybe you're not ready to sell. Maybe you're just emotionally not ready. So we have some tools that helps clients to decide if they're ready to sell. Um, and, you know, a lot of times business owners, their entire identity is and not in a bad way, but their identity is the business. And once you no longer have the business, and if you're maybe a little bit older, sometimes you lose that purpose and life is really no fun. A lot of business owners are not that happy 
after selling businesses. So we we help business owners to make sure that they are ready. Um, we have a, a, a pre-score, a personal readiness to exit. And then we also help businesses to look at the eight drivers of value uh, to maximize each one of those so that so that the value of the business can be maximized. And it's just more fun to run a business that's sellable because a sellable business is a profitable business. And typically it's easier to run because you have systems and processes in place. Yeah. Amen to that. I want to dive in there where you said you have uh, the eight drivers of business value. I want to put this on the screen though, because you mentioned you have an assessment on mm -hmm. your website yep. where people can go in and see if how sellable their business is. Um, all of my assets.com. So go check out David's website, take his assessment, see where your business lies, but can you dive in? And I, you know, we don't have a ton of time here, but can you go through some of these eight drivers and what could maybe influence them good or bad? Sure. Absolutely. So let's start with probably the most important one and also the most common one. And that's what we call the hub and spoke. And if you think about a wheel and if you think about, you know, the hub is the business owner and, and all the spokes go to the, go to the business owner. So if too much of everything in the business has to go through the business owner, then that's a crappy business, right? I mean, would you buy a business where you had to be involved with everything or would you rather buy something that uses more of a franchise type model where you have systems and processes and things like that? So one of the, the, the questions that we have to all be very honest about is ask yourself, would you buy your business from you? And would you pay a premium? Would you be willing to pay a premium for your business or would you have to buy it at a discount because it's such a train wreck? And, um, you know, a lot of things like even having the owner's name and the title of the business that lowers the value because once that owner is no longer around, then people might say, Hey, you know, why, why would I go back? You know, the guy that I've been going to see all the time is no longer there. I'll just take my business elsewhere. So, one of the major va value drivers is the hub and spoke. And we, we help businesses to figure business owners to figure out ways to get out of the way. So then they can sell a business. That's not really just selling a job because nobody wants to buy a job. Why would you want to buy a job? You'd much rather buy a business where the previous business owner was able to go to, go to, go to Europe for three months at a time. Cause that's a well-run business. Yeah, absolutely. That is a huge one. And we've touched on that recently. Um, I, I was on, I mentioned this to David before we, we started going live here. Uh, I was on a panel last week about this very topic, about selling your business, um, getting out of the way as the owner. And that was one of the huge sticking points that um, all of the panelists were discussing. But I don't think enough people understand um, because a lot of our clients, when they come in too, they're, whether they're solopreneurs or they have a small team, they don't get to that point of putting systems on other people and integrating their teams into the system creation and business creation. So what are what are some of the ways an owner can get out of the way quickly from your perspective to actually remove themselves from the hub and get more into one of the spokes? So like almost any other area in life where, where progress can occur, it's going to start between our ears. And I think the first thing is the owner has to say, I'm not that freaking important. You know, there are people that can do things better than I can do them. So as an example, um, and I actually have an appointment with her in a, in, in, a, in a few hours, bookkeeping, right? So for my business, I can figure out how to do bookkeeping. I'm not going to do it well. I don't enjoy it. I'll probably fall behind and then have to do it for, for you know, for weeks straight towards the end of the year. <clears throat> or... I can say, I'm going to find someone. And this lady loves bookkeeping. It's crazy. She's like, I enjoy this stuff. I'm like, are you insane? How could anybody like bookkeeping? But she does. Um, so I pay her, you know, so we have a trade. I pay her to take something off of my plate that I don't like doing and that that I'm not good at. And she does it and she gets paid and she enjoys, enjoys doing it. So you have to ask yourself, if, if if even if it's a perception and it's not true, can somebody else do this task and can they do it for maybe 70 to 80% as well as I can? And if they can, then just let them do it. And, you know, document processes and everything. But, um, and what you'll probably realize is not only can they do it 70% as well as you can, they can probably do it much better than you can. But we all have, kind of have this mindset that you know, I'm the owner, I have to do this. So I think at its core, it's really, really a mindset issue. And sometimes we even feel like we're letting customers down, like if we don't call them back personally. But if you think about, 
Have you ever had a maybe a phone call from your doctor or from your doctor's office? Maybe they called you back and, and a nurse or somebody called you and said, hey, Brandon, you know, your cholesterol is a little bit high. Well, that's great. Well, it's not great, but but the doctor didn't need to call you and tell you that. Now, the nurse might have said, and the doctor using, you know, his or her expertise says, you know, here's the treatment. So the doctor did the expensive work that needed expertise. And then someone who's just, uh, I don't want to even say a different level, but they called you and relayed the news to you. And that's fine. You didn't feel like, oh, wow, the doctor should have stopped surgery to call me that my blood pressure was a little bit high. No, you just kind of understood that that's how that, that office works. So I think we, we, we have these preconceived notions that, that, that clients expect us to be involved with everything and they don't. Yeah. And in that particular scenario and same with the accountant, if my doctor or my accountant is on the phone, I know I'm in for some really bad news. <laughs> so I, I love sure. hearing from the nurse, from my bookkeeper. That's mm -hmm. an amazing conversation. Um, sure. Yeah. So let's, let's reword that for uh, all my what ifers listening out there. So what we talk about is the four D's delete, delay, delegate, and do Mm -hmm. So you go through those backwards, you try to delete everything first and only the things that are above that golden line that you uniquely can do yourself, you do. Mm -hmm. Everything else right. gets delegated, delayed or deleted. And I think that's a super important uh, you know, thing to, to hit on, especially removing the owner. There's not that many things that you have to do yourself uh, as right. the owner. So amazing tip right there. Um, can we go through one more driver yeah. of business value. Yeah. Let's go probably. through um, another one that's very important is recurring revenue. Mm. So there's a difference between recurring and reoccurring. So you might, um, let's say, take your family to Chick-fil-A, you know, twice a month. That's reoccurring because you might not go back there every, but let's say Netflix, you're, you know, you're paying every month. So the, the value of a business that has recurring revenue is substantially higher than the value of a business that has to basically keep selling products and services to you every single time. So let's say real estate agents, real estate agents can make a, a lot of money, but if you're just in real estate sales, there's literally nothing for you to sell when it comes time to sell your business because you're only getting paid when you're selling homes. Now, if a real estate agent got into some property management where they had contracts with, with tenants and they're getting paid X amount of dollars every month to manage the properties, that becomes the sellable part of the business. But, um, you know, well, let me ask you, if I'm selling one product to one person once in their life, or if I'm selling um, a subscription of something to some, to, to my clients and they're being billed every month until they cancel, which one of those businesses would you pay a more, a, a higher multiple for? Yeah, I think that one's easy. It's the, it's the recurring one every single month, mm -hmm. but let me ask you, is there an approximate multiple of difference? It's hard to compare real estate to Netflix. Yeah, yeah, no, it can be, yeah. I mean, it can be huge. I mean, it can be double and triple the, the multiple wow. um, for sure. It can, it can definitely be huge. So one of the things that it's important to do, and I can give you one example, um, florists and our, and our uh, um, florists tend to make a lot of money, you know, a, a few times a year. So Mother's Day, Valentine's, things like that. Well, there are some florists that have gotten on a recurring revenue model where they have been able to, in bigger cities, go into uh, expensive restaurants and hotels, and the restaurants and hotels would pay a monthly fee, and then the uh, the florist comes in every week or, or however often and replaces plants, puts new plants for seasonality and things like that. So now instead of having to, you know, almost have a make or break that, you know, for these two months of the year, this is going to make or break our year, these florists have like um, recurring predictable revenue. So, you know, the owner knows within reason how much money is going to be coming in each month. And um, that's a much, much, much more sellable business. So most businesses, if you think about it, can figure out some ways to have recurring revenue. And if you can build recurring revenue, you're, um, you're doing much better than if you're having one-time sales. Absolutely. Yeah. I was going to hit on that too, because a lot of people will push back and say, well, my business is too unique. I can't develop recurring revenue streams or subscription models. You're not thinking hard enough. Mm -hmm. if that, that is a perfect example with a florist um, and any business can come up with a subscription model of some sort. And it doesn't sure. have to be your whole business, just adding to 
your revenue that's, streams. Better. That's because you can still sell flowers on on Mother's Day and Valentine's Day, yeah. but also have the subscription model for part of your part of your business. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And I think that's a, a, a that's a, a trap that business owners get into is that like a, they have to do all or nothing for anything. And you know, like we talked about delegating and getting out of the way. Well, if you've been involved with almost every aspect of your business for the last five years pretty much by tomorrow, you're still going to be involved with 99.9% .9 of it. And then maybe by the next week, 99.8. So it's not going to be all or nothing. You're not going to be uninvolved with everything by next week, but it needs to be a process to where you're, you're making progress towards not being involved with everything. And you're making progress towards having some of your revenue be recurring. Yeah, that's a really good way to look at it. Um, so this has been an amazing conversation, especially around exiting your business, preparing your, your business for sale and valuing your biggest asset. So let's tie this together to the harmonious architecture. Then we'll wrap up with David. Um, but we've talked about a number of the diff different disciplines and I'm sure his eight value drivers are going to go through even more of them when you take the assessment, but let's talk about the obvious ones, right? Uh, inspire your, your leadership, yourself. You have to work on yourself, your mindset and getting yourself out of the way. We also talked about order, which is your process management. If your processes are not in place, you don't have systems to get yourself out of the day to day and remove yourself from the business. You cannot sell. Well, I mean, you can, but to someone who just wants to buy a job, but your multiple is going to reduce significantly. So is your, the price for your business. Um, and of course, this whole discussion centers around risk and defense. Your, your risk and defense is, is foundational in what is your business multiple? What is it sellable for? Um, and of course, your strategy to exit when the time comes. So for me personally, I'm sure David would echo this too. The time to start thinking about exiting your business is now, if not yesterday, if not three years ago, no matter when you want to get out. So um, I, I want you to go and visit David's website, allofmyassets.com. Um, and, and David, where else can people connect with you? And where can we learn a little bit more about uh, what you do? Yeah. So if you check out my podcast, uh, the Weekly Wealth Podcast, it's on um, www.weeklywealthpodcast.com, or you can just find it on any of the other platforms. I talk about... <clears throat> the mindsets, the tactics, and the strategies that help uh, you to build and maintain wealth. And what I believe is that how we handle our money should positively impact our lives and the lives of those around us. So we're not like a, hey, where is the markets going? Is Apple going to go up or down? Um, but we're, we talk about just how to have a better life by how you handle your business. And, and I think that's just so important because money health, relationships, and spirituality, those are like the cornerstones of life. And we're not really taught that. Um, we're not, we're certainly not talk, taught the logistical aspects of money. Like what is an interest rate? What is a stock? What is a bond? But we're definitely not taught like how money works in relationships and, and, and how to have harmonious relationships and how to have freedom and things like that. So my goal is that my clients, uh, my financial planning clients and our listeners, they simply have a better life, you know, by having, by how, the, how they handle their, uh, their money. That's awesome. So I put that on the screen too. Well, weeklywealthpodcast.com. Go check out David's podcast if you want to dive deeper into all this. Um, and he said harmonious, not me. So I want to give you points. Uh, but oh. if you want to sell your business, selling a harmonious business is a million times easier than selling a business that doesn't run well. So David, thank you again for joining me today. This was a great episode. And again, all of my assets.com. Go check out that assessment. See how sellable your business is. We'll see you next time on Harmonious at Lunch. And for now, we're signing off. See ya. Awesome. Thanks.